We've already covered so many topics in this course, but there is one more thing that firmly belongs to modern C++ that we did not really touch upon. Lambdas. Imagine we have a list of people represented as a struct person, and we would like to sort them by age. We can try using the standard sort function for that. But the naive call to standard sort will fail, and the compiler will throw a long error at us. This error message might be quite scary, but if we scroll all the way up, we will see that this error comes down to this line that states that there is no less than operator defined for the two person objects. You see, by default, standard sort will apply the operator less than to the provided arguments, and unless we define such operator for our person class, this operator does not exist. However, there is another overload of standard sort function that we can use. We can provide a lambda expression that compares to person objects. And now standard sort sorts our Tolkien characters by age in ascending order. So let's talk about what lambdas are, how to write them in such a way that they operate safely and efficiently, and yes, how they make this a valid piece of C++ code. My aim for today is to walk us through what lambdas are and the reasons they exist, as well as roughly talk about how they work under the hood. As this topic comes relatively late in our modern C++ course, we have the advantage of being able to understand how lambdas operate using a bunch of things we already know about functions, classes, and a bit of templates. As a first step, though, I'd like to briefly talk about what standard sort does to whatever third argument we pass into it. It, well, calls it with two person objects as the input arguments. But what do we really mean when we say that something gets called? Clearly, we can call a function, more or less by definition. By extension, we can claim that anything that we can call through an operator round brackets is also callable, which opens a whole new perspective on how to create these callable things. In most cases, simple is good enough. As we've just mentioned, the simplest callable is a function. In our example from before, we don't really need to use a lambda. If we write a function less that takes two person objects and pass its pointer to standard sort, it will do the trick and the objects will get sorted. Now that we can also drop the ampersand in the standard sort call, and the code will do exactly the same thing. The reason for this if you're interested, is that functions can be implicitly converted to function pointers. They are special in this way. You can always read more on this at cbpreference.com following the link in the description to this video. But what if we need to have a certain state stored in our callable? For example, what if we wouldn't want to sort our person objects by their absolute age, but by the difference of their age with respect to some number, say 42, 42? Behold function objects or sometimes also called functors, although we should prefer the former name to avoid confusion. These are objects for which the function call operator is defined, or in other words, that define an operator round brackets. As they define this operator, they can be called, and so they are also callable. Which means that if we want to sort our array by an age difference to some number, we can create a class comparison to query age that has a member query age and an operator round brackets that compares the age difference of the two provided person objects instead of comparing their ages between each other. Once we pass an object of this class as the callable into the standard sort, we can see that our Tolkien characters are now sorted by their age difference to the number 4242, just like we wanted. We already know a lot about classes, so I hope that what we've just covered seems quite self-explanatory. And now I think it makes sense to look a bit deeper into how standard sort is implemented. How does it magically take anything that looks like a callable and just rolls with it. Please pause here for a moment and think how would you implement this. And I'll go edit this video in the meantime. A few moments later. Okay, now that you got to the answer on your own, the key is, of course, to think back to the lectures in which we cover templates. We can hopefully all imagine that using templates would allow us to implement a function similar to standard sort, where the begin and end iterators, as well as the comparator callable, all have some template type that is guessed by the compiler at compile time. Note, though, that our interest here is not to implement a better sorting algorithm, 
so feel free to ignore the actual implementation, but to gain intuition about how we could implement a generic algorithm that takes any comparator object that is callable with two person objects, be it a function pointer or a function object. And if we run this, we get the expected output. Note also that from C++20 on, this code would become more readable and safe as we could use concepts instead of raw templates. Please tell me in the comments if you would be interested in hearing more about that. Oh, one more thing. The story, of course, doesn't end with standard sort. There is a number of functions that take similar function objects. For some examples, see standard find if, standard for each, standard transform, and many more. However, it might not be convenient to always define a new struct, class, or even a function for every single use case. Sometimes we want to use such a function object only locally, once, and don't want to expose it to the outside world, nor to deal with any additional boilerplate code. The strive to enable such convenience is what brought us the lambda expression, or colloquially lambdas. They're really just syntactic sugar for defining our own function objects, just like the comparison to query age class we talked about before. The syntax of defining a lambda expression is a little different from what we've seen until now. Um, let's modify our example to use lambdas instead of functions and function objects and look closer at how we can define and use lambdas in our programs. Here we use three different lambdas. All of them follow the same general syntax that largely looks like this. They all have some arguments that can be omitted should they not be needed, a body that defines what the lambdas actually do, and the return type that we can also provide explicitly, but if we don't, it will be deduced from the return statement within the lambda function. If we assign our lambda to a variable, we can store our lambda object and reuse it multiple times. And if you are wondering, the type of this lambda will be some unique unnamed type that the compiler will make up on its own. Now it is time we talk about the stuff inside the square brackets, the capture list. It is a new thing to us and is the syntax that we can easily recognize lambdas by. The first two lambdas we use have an empty capture list, but the third one captures the query age variable in it. What this really means is that the query age variable is copied such that it becomes available inside of the lambda body. If we look back at function objects we discussed before, this lambda behaves exactly the same as comparison to query age class. In our case, query age is a small variable, a single int, but if we want to capture a bigger variable, we would like to avoid unnecessary copies. So we'd like to capture it by reference. Any variable we would like to capture by reference, we prefix with an ampersand symbol. We can also provide as many captured variables as we want, specifying for each if we want to capture them by copy or by reference. Here, one and three will be captured by reference, while two is captured by copy. Alternatively, we can capture all variables visible at the moment of lambda definition. If we want to capture all variables by copy, we can use equals as the first capture. And if we want some variables to be captured by reference, we can specify such variables further in the capture list. Should we want to capture all variables by reference instead, we can pass a single ampersand symbol. Almost opposite to the previous setup, if we want some variables to still be captured by copy, we can simply append them to the capture list. Finally, if a lambda appears within a class method, we might want it to have access to all the data within the current object. For that, we can pass this into the lambda capture list and use the object data without issues. Note that just to show that this is possible, we call the lambda in place right after declaring it. And on that note, now that we've discussed most of the syntax we used for lambdas, we can see that the lambda from the start of this video is just a definition of a lambda that has an empty capture list, no arguments, empty body, which is called in place right after creation, doing nothing, of course. This lambda is totally useless, apart from the entertainment value it provides. All in all, lambdas are neat and efficient. If we need a lambda object to pass to some function and we don't think we'll ever want to reuse it like in our example with sorting, lambdas should be our go-to tool. Another typical use case for lambdas is in situations when we find ourselves writing a long function and we end up outlining each logical step we take by a comment. 
I'm sure we've all seen code like this, but just to illustrate this, let's have a look at a small example code for, say, creating a sandwich. This process takes a bunch of steps. Uh, we need to prepare the bread, prepare the ingredients, and finally assemble the whole sandwich. Here, we outline each step with a comment that corresponds to our actions. The main issue with comments is that if we change the implementation, it is really easy to forget to update the corresponding comments, because, well, the compiler doesn't really see them. So comments tend to drift out of sync with the code. I much prefer putting each step into a separate lambda instead. Now it is a bit harder to make a mistake, and in my experience the situation in which the function name lambda or not does not correspond to what is happening inside of it is much more often caught during code review than a comment that went out of sync. This trick is sometimes useful for header-only libraries as we cannot use functions in unnamed namespaces there. One thing to be wary of, though, is to try not to get used to capturing all variables by default. And while it might be tempting to always capture all the observed variables by reference using the ampersand in the capture list, in my experience, it sometimes makes it harder to understand what the lambda really does when reading the code. So, in most of my code, I prefer to capture only the variables I really need, as opposed to blanket capturing all the visible ones. But I'm interested in what you guys think about it, so please comment below the video with your experience with this. And this is pretty much most of the things we need to know about lambdas. But if you ever need more details on anything here, please refer to cppreference.com page. And uh, as always, please play around with the examples I provided here, or write your own. I firmly believe that the best way to learn is to make your own mistakes. All in all, lambdas are a useful tool in our toolbox, and we'll find that we want to use them quite often when we write modern C++ code. I hope that I could build parallels with what we have already learned until now, so that you can get all the use out of lambdas while not being scared of what they do under the hood. And if you'd like to refresh why we need templates, please click the video over here, or maybe have another look at what kinds of libraries we have over here instead. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye!